Thank you, Professor Newton. My name is Rachel Johnston, and I am the president of the Legal Aid Society. And together with Sam Sergent, president of the International Law Society, and Reem Blake, president of the Middle Eastern Law Students Association, we would like to welcome Representative Bayan Sami Abdul Rahman to Vanderbilt Law. Born in Baghdad, she lived in Iran for a time before relocating to the United Kingdom with her family, where she attended school at the University of London. She spent 17 years as a journalist, winning the Observer newspaper's Farzad Bazoft Memorial Prize in 1993, and later serving as reporter for the Financial Times in Britain and Japan as Tokyo correspondent. She was elected to the leadership council of the Kurdistan Democratic Party in 2010, then appointed as High Representative to the United Kingdom before her current appointment as the Representative to the United States. We would like to congratulate the Kurdish community on the 72% turnout and the 93% vote in favor of the independence referendum. Please join us in welcoming the representative. Well, thank you so much for that very warm welcome. I'd like to thank Professor Newton uh, for the hospitality and Rachel and Reem and Sam uh, for this very warm welcome and introduction that I've had today. I've spent most of the day here at uh, Vanderbilt and I'm so impressed. <laughs> My university in London didn't look grand like this. It was very grubby. And I am so proud and so humbled that just two days after our historic referendum, I'm in Nashville, little Kurdistan in the United States. So I'm so happy to be here today and to share this wonderful moment with all of you. So as Sam said, no, I think it was Reem, you said that the result was 92.7% in favor of an independent Kurdistan. And this is following a turnout of 72%. So a clear, overwhelming majority of people in Iraqi Kurdistan have voted in favor of independence. I don't think it was ever in doubt that something like this would be the result. And maybe this is why the world tried to stop us. They didn't want to hear the truth. The truth is that the people of Kurdistan have the right to have a referendum. We have the right to self-determination, a right that is enshrined in the UN Charter and our right for independence uh, is also enshrined in other laws and customs. So what led us to this moment? Why did we decide to have the referendum now when so many friends and foes encouraged us, sometimes bullied us, not to hold the referendum at this particular time? Of course, some were saying, don't hold it now, hold it in the future. Others were saying, don't ever think about having a referendum. So the voices were loud and persistent. Well, from our perspective, Kurdistan has had a terrible history as part of Iraq. Iraq was created about 100 years ago. It hasn't been a country at peace with itself or at peace with its neighbors. It's had a history of turbulence, of coup d'etats, of revolutions. It's had very bloody transfers of power. How many of you Kurds who are here today have seen friends hanging from lampposts, and not just Kurds, Arabs too. I remember when I was a child, my parents telling me that they have seen the bodies of their friends hanging from the lampposts of Baghdad because they had been executed for one reason or other. Under Saddam Hussein, the brutality against the Kurdish people reached an un unbelievable level. We had repeated acts of genocide, not just one. We had Halabja in, in March 1988. 5,000 people were killed through poison gas, and more than 10,000 were injured. 
In the same year, 1988, the Anfal genocide campaign was carried out. Over 180,000 people were killed or disappeared in that genocide campaign. In 1983, 8,000 men and boys from the Barzani tribe disappeared. In the late 70s and early 80s, during particularly the Iran-Iraq war, thousands of Faili Kurds, a religious minority, were rounded up and disappeared. And of course, more recently, we've had the genocide of the Yazidis and Christians and other minorities at the hands of ISIS. So this has been our history in Iraq. After 91, when there was a no-fly zone established over Iraqi Kurdistan, and we were able to govern ourselves to some extent, we got off to a good start. We fell into a terrible civil war, which all of us pray will never be repeated, and I believe it will not, because we have faced many political crises in recent years, and nobody has even got near to the point of a civil war, even though our detractors often like to think that we might do so. The 1990s, eventually there was a peace, a ceasefire, and the two warring parties have been in a coalition government since 2006. And this is now, I'm, I'm talking about the new era, post-2003. So throughout the 90s, we were almost independent. We had our own parliament, our own institutions. We began to establish foreign relations. And you could argue that we've had de facto independence since 1991. Then you come to 2003. It became clear that the United States intended to liberate Iraq from a genocidal dictator. For us, it was a liberation. And it would be for you as well if you had had to endure a dictatorship like Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. We had to make a decision. We had, in effect, de facto independence. Did we want to join Iraq or not? And our leadership decide, decided that it would join, that we should join Iraq, because this would be a new Iraq. We believed that we were entering an Iraq that would be federal, democratic, secular, and an Iraq of partnership and consensus. We, with the fellow Arab Iraqis, drafted the constitution that was ratified by the vast majority of people across Iraq and Kurdistan in 2005. The constitution stipulates a voluntary union in Iraq, a voluntary union. It stipulates how we, all of the people of Iraq, will live together all of the democratic institutions that would be established, the federal institutions, institutions that would ensure that Iraq is a federation, that there would be freedom of expression, that the minorities would be protected, human rights would be upheld, and so on. And within the Constitution, there were articles to find a way of dealing with the issue of the disputed territories, places like Kirkuk, Sinjar, and others. We now look back and we see that 55 of the 144 articles have been violated by Baghdad. 12 of the articles that required laws to be passed have been ignored or neglected. Some of the examples that I can give you. Article 140, which establishes a mechanism to normalize the disputed territories. And to explain that, I need to give you some background. The disputed territories, people always focus on Kirkuk because it has oil, but there are other places too. These places were Arabized under Saddam Hussein, and this was his own expression. So what happened was Kurdish families were thrown out, literally just in the clothes they were standing in, would be thrown out. Some disappeared, some were moved elsewhere, some were put in jail. And Arab families from the south were given money and were told to come and live in that house, take over that business, take over that farm. And this is what the Arabization program was. My own family in Sinjar was a victim to the Arabization program. So Article 140 of the Iraqi Constitution sets out a mechanism 
where the original inhabitants who can prove they were from those places can return, the people who were moved in and settled in their homes or took over their homes would be compensated and encouraged to move back to where they originally came from. Then there would be a census and then a referendum would be held so that the people of those, dis those disputed territories could decide whether they want to be part of Kurdistan region or not. The deadline for implementing Article 140 was the end of 2007. Baghdad had no intention of implementing Article 140, and I regret to say that the international community was complicit in this. They also wanted to kick the can down the road, believing that this was a problem that could be dealt with later. We argued that problems like this fester, problems like this get worse with time, not better. So this is one of the key articles of the Constitution that has not been implemented. There are many other articles that have been violated or ignored. For example, Iraq is not a true federation. The, supreme, the law to, the, that needs to be passed to establish a Supreme Court has not been passed. The Supreme Court that Iraq has now is a leftover of a transitional period. Iraq's parliament should have a second chamber, according to the constitution. The second chamber is supposed to represent the governorates and the regions as a way of protecting the rights of the provinces and the regions and ensuring the federal status of Iraq. That law establishing the second chamber has never been passed. The Peshmerga, who are the legitimate legally recognized army of the Kurdistan region are also recognized in the Iraqi constitution as part of Iraq's defense system. And yet, the Peshmerga have never been paid out of Iraq's defense budget. They have never been trained or equipped as part of Iraq's defense budget or defense mechanism and system. When the United States delivered over $200 million of weapons and equipment to the Peshmerga. It sat in a warehouse because Prime Minister Maliki wouldn't deliver it to the Peshmerga. And it was only after ISIS came that we finally managed to get some of those weapons. This is a violation of the Iraqi constitution. It, the constitution stipulates that Iraq is a country with two official languages, Kurdish and Arabic. You try speaking Kurdish in any Iraqi ministry and see if anybody will reply to you. We expected the new Iraq after 2003 or even after 2005 when the constitution was ratified. We expected the new Iraq to be federal, democratic, an Iraq of partnership, an Iraq that would be federal and that would recognize the rights of all of the components. That constitution and the federal structure that we strive for are the only guarantees that a country like Iraq can survive. A country where you have different sects, you have the Shia and the Sunnis, you have Kurds and Arabs, you have Muslims, Christians, Yazidis, Shabaks, Kakis, so many other minorities. You can only survive together like this if power is devolved and if there is a sense of partnership, not when you have a centralized authority, an author authoritarian regime that disrespects its own constitution. So around 2004, our leadership began to say that this new Iraq that we had signed up to was not working and that it was time to have a referendum to ask the people of Kurdistan what they want in their future. At that time, the idea of a referendum was postponed. It was shelved because ISIS was the big threat. But the idea of a referendum is not new. It was first seriously discussed in 2014. We agreed to set this aside so that we could concentrate on fighting ISIS and I would say that we've proven ourselves to be the most effective fighters against ISIS, both in Iraq and in Syria. 
we have taken care of 1.8 million displaced Iraqis and Syrian refugees. That's 97% of all Syrian refugees in Iraq are in Kurdistan. And about 50% of displaced Iraqis are in Kurdistan. We have shouldered an enormous responsibility, and we have done it with pride because we see it as our duty. So many of us, so many of you in this room, have been refugees and displaced yourselves. And it's because of our own experience that we have opened our doors, even though it's had a huge impact on the host community. We have to share the electricity supply, the water supply, our education and healthcare services. The healthcare service in Kurdistan is on the brink of collapse because it was designed to take care of five and a half million people. It is now providing care to seven million people without a budget that can help us expand the service. So since ISIS has been on the scene, Baghdad has not paid our, federal, our share of the federal budget. Baghdad has not provided equipment, training, or support to the Peshmerga. Baghdad has done very little to support us in the humanitarian crisis. So at this dark moment, at this moment of most need, of unity, Baghdad does nothing to help us. When should Baghdad help us if it doesn't do so now or in the past three years? So our leadership has decided that this is the right time for a referendum. And two days ago, on September 25th, there was a referendum across Iraqi Kurdistan. And those of us who live abroad, live in Europe and the United States, we were able to vote electronically. And I know that I speak for my friends and many, many other people across Kurdistan. It was a very charged, emotional moment for all of us. We were voting on behalf of all of those who died in the path to liberty, in the path that brought us to today. And we were voting yes to an independent Kurdistan for future generations, because none of us want our children to be faced with another genocide. We believe that an independent Kurdistan, a sovereign state, is the best guarantor of our security and stability in the region. So what's been the reaction since Monday? Threats is the answer. Our neighbors have threatened us. Baghdad is threatening us. Uh, Iran is threatening and has, I believe, closed the border. Uh, Iraq is threatening to cancel flights and take over our airports, the border controls. Uh, Baghdad is effectively threatening us with military and economic sanctions. And uh, Turkey and Iran are also threatening uh, various things. Some of them have already turned into action, other things have not. Um, so far, they are threats rather than action. Our perspective is that these threats don't help anybody. Yes, they can hurt us economically, but the people of Kurdistan are resilient. The people of Kurdistan went into this referendum with their eyes open. They knew what the consequences could be. But we are investing in our future. It may be tough in the days ahead, in the weeks ahead, but we're investing in our future and the future of our children and our grandchildren. And that is a price worth paying for. We ask Baghdad to bring down the rhetoric, to bring down the threats, and to engage in dialogue. We are still part of Iraq. We have not declared independence. We declared a referendum. We exercised a democratic right, a right to self-determination that is enshrined in the UN Charter, that is enshrined in international laws. This is what we've done. We haven't imposed any act of aggression against anyone. We have taken a democratic step since 1991, several countries have held referendums on independence. Some of them are in Europe, Latvia, Lithuania, Croatia, those countries, Scotland more recently, Quebec in Canada. 
I don't know, maybe they were, but I don't remember that they were met with the kind of threats that we're being met, met with. And I'm happy to say that we are also getting many messages of support. Just earlier today, Chuck Schumer, who is the Senate Democratic leader, issued a very strong statement in support of our right to self-determination, in support of our right to independence, and he's urging the administration to do the same. There are many members of Congress, individual members of Congress, who have told us face to face that they support our right to self-determination or they support our right to independence. There are other friends in Congress who support the Peshmerga, respect Kurdistan, uh, but do not want to see Iraq separated or to disintegrate into different states. We respect their views, but we ask them to encourage the administration, to encourage Baghdad, to engage in dialogue with us. Threatening us, sanctioning against us will not work. We will survive it, and Baghdad will still have to come and talk to us. That is all that we're asking for them to do. I would also add that I think it's in the interests of the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, the UN, other countries, to do the same, Engar encourage Erbil and Baghdad to negotiate. It's in the interests of Baghdad and Erbil to have a stable Iraq, to go into the Iraqi elections in 2018 with peace and stability. We wish to support Prime Minister Abadi in the elections, and I think he needs our support. We believe that Baghdad and Erbil need to cooperate on the issues that still face us, the humanitarian crisis, the challenge against ISIS. And so these threats don't help any of those situations. These threats don't help the displaced people have any confidence in the future. If we all collectively want the displaced people to be able to return to their homes in dignity, then Erbil and Baghdad need to be on the same page. It would also help the United States and the international community to play a part, if they played a part, in their wish to try to shape how things evolve in the Middle East. It's not just Kurdistan and Iraq that are discussing borders, let's say. It's not just Kurdistan and Iraq that have a tension between them. And ours is just a tension right now. But in Syria, you have a conflict. In Yemen, you have a very serious conflict. You have the Arab Spring still having an impact on many countries across the Middle East. Libya has an issue with ISIS, with its own continuing civil conflict. If the United States and the international community wants to be able to shape the future in the Middle East, it needs to engage in dialogue and it needs to press Erbil and Baghdad to get to the negotiating table. Today I've met so many wonderful, extremely bright students here at Vanderbilt and it's been a real great pleasure to be here. And I've learned so much from all of you about international law, about the freedom of expression, about other examples of countries that have taken steps towards independence. But everything that I've heard today, and even the threats, even the words of support that we're getting from around the world, just make me feel more and more confident that we did the right thing to have a referendum on September 25th. It was now or never. And now we need to engage in a dialogue with Baghdad and we need to engage in a dialogue with our neighbors and with our international partners. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today, for listening and for inviting me to be here. Thank you very much. As one who worked on the Unfall Genocide case, um, 
at length many, many times. The, the notion that those thousands and thousands and thousands of victims were in some sense represented in this referendum is, is deeply moving. And I, I had not contemplated that thought. Um, you saw the joy of people who were moving and to vote, and many of you in this room voted electronically. I've seen the certifications that came in. That's a powerful thing. Uh, but, of course, you're up against, as you recognize and realize, the realities of the world in which we do live. Uh, so I will ask the first question and, and just tee it up so I will also recognize and monitor follow-on questions. So just get my attention. We'll do our very best to get as many questions as time permits. Um, I also have a predilection for student questions and for uh, questions from people in the community. So just do my atten uh, get, get my attention and Maria will make sure that the microphone moves its way around. Um, I'm intrigued because I've heard it many, many times, this idea of now or never, this idea that this was the perfect time. Um, and I'd like to sort of do uh, a before and after retrospective. Uh, talk us through, and for the record, for the people that are watching on live stream, the mechanics of the decision to go ahead and hold a referendum, and then as, as various parties frame pragmatic objectives that said, well, no, now isn't the better time, or you know, why go ahead, go ahead once that initial decision was made, persist in that decision. You know, in other words, if, 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 if now or never was really the sense, Help us get a better understanding of why that was. And then I will recognize questions and monitor the conversation as long as we have time. Maria. Uh, well, I'd like to again thank you so much, Professor Newton, for everything that you did for the people of Iraq and your, uh, in the important role you played in the Iraq High Tribunal. Um, the cases were not just Kurdish cases. Many people across Iraq suffered. Um, with regards to why now and how we reached the decision to go ahead on September 25th, so as I said earlier, the idea of a referendum has been around for some time, uh, but it was put aside because of ISIS, the humanitarian crisis, the economic crisis, and so on. But it also became clear to us that three years after ISIS first came, the problems that existed in Iraq in 2014, the problems that partly helped ISIS gain support and find fertile ground in Iraq are still there. And that although Prime Minister Abadi is uh, much easier for us to deal with than some of the previous Prime Ministers in Iraq, he hasn't delivered on some of the promises he made. Uh, when he was first going to become Prime Minister, the Kurdish leadership didn't want to engage in Baghdad. So we were going to not engage in the parliament, we were not going to send our ministers to Baghdad. And it was uh, under international pressure and also promises from Baghdad that this would be a govern government of partnership. Prime Minister Abadi uh, promised that one of the, his first decisions or acts as Prime Minister would be to release our budget. Prime Minister Maliki had cut off, unconstitutionally, had cut off our budget six months earlier. And Prime Minister Abadi said he would reinstate our budget as one of his first acts as Prime Minister. Well, three years later, we still don't have our budget. So while Prime Minister Abadi, as again, you know, we will support him in the elections, um, but he hasn't been the Prime Minister that we expected. And under the guise of economic reforms or structural reforms in Baghdad, various decisions have been made that actually have been detrimental to our relationship with Baghdad. So that, that was one of the factors that the problems of Iraq that existed in 2014 largely remain in place. And we don't see a future for Kurdistan in Iraq. We don't see that Iraq will become federal, democratic, and an Iraq of partnership. And we genuinely believe that while under one roof, we have not been able to live together in harmony, in partnership. We genuinely believe that as neighbors, that is possible. 
we believe that an independent Kurdistan will actually make for a stronger Iraq because the rest of Iraq will no longer have the Kurdish problem, the Kurdish exception, and those pesky Kurds to deal with. They can just deal with their own issues and have the kind of <laughs> and so on. And it is much, much more possible that an independent Kurdish state and an independent Iraqi state will be good neighbors. But under one roof, we're not. Uh, I know that Israel was one of the first, and if not, I might, might be the only country to publicly come out and support uh, Kurdish independence. Can you talk a little about how that relationship is developing or built or where that's coming from? Well, we don't have uh, any official or diplomatic relations with Israel. Um, according to the Iraqi constitution, foreign policy is the remit of Baghdad. So when the Iraqi government doesn't have a relationship with a country, then we have to respect that. But there are, I think, at least 150,000 Kurds who are Israeli. Um, they, when Israel was, collect, uh, was created, they were either pushed out of Iraq or they flew to Israel voluntarily. So there is a Kurdish community, a substantial community there. And we don't have any issue with Judaism as a religion. We don't have an issue with Israel as a country. By the way, we also support the Palestinians. I should be clear about that, too. Um, so our relationship with Israel is, is not an official relationship. It's more maybe grassroots. It's more, you know, unofficial. Um, as you say, Israel has come out in favor of an independent state. We believe that more countries will come out and publicly say this because they have said it to us in private, including some Arab countries. Um, but maybe under international pressure or UN pressure, they didn't say this publicly beforehand. But there are European countries too. I mean, if you look at the European Union statement before the referendum, it was virulently against the referendum and so on. But when you talk to individual European Union members, they're much more nuanced in their respect for the right to self-determination. It is a democratic right, and I think it's very difficult for a democratic country, whether it's Canada, United States, UK, France, to be against a democratic process. So I think there are many, many more countries that eventually will come out in support. To expand on the question Professor Newton asked at the beginning, I was reading this article in Haaretz today about the referendum, and it's titled, um, Independent Kurdistan Looks Like a Zimbabwe in the Making, which gives you a sense of what its slant is. And it, it concludes by saying, um, Kurdistan should, quote, wait and focus on getting its politics and economics in order first, end quote, before declaring independence. I'm curious, what's your response to people who say that Kurdistan should sort of figure out its own problems before declaring independence? Uh, I haven't read that article, so I can't really comment specifically, but on the general theme that the article appears to raise, I would actually argue that uh, this referendum itself pushed us to begin to put our house in order. Uh, we settled an arbitration case that we had uh, a, a dispute with uh, a company that has a contract uh, for gas in Kurdistan. We reactivated our parliament and it came out in support of the referendum. Uh, we have unity across the political spectrum in a way that we haven't had for a very long time. Uh, there are 17 political parties that are represented in parliament and government in Kurdistan, 17. 15 of them, very early on, way back in June, were in favor of the referendum being held on the 25th of September. 
the two parties came out at the very last moment in favor of the referendum. So I would argue, actually, we have more unity now politically than we've had for a long time. And on the issue of uh, things like, uh, I assume by Zimbabwe, they're talking about corruption or lack of transparency. Actually, this economic crisis that we've had over the past three years, which has been brought on by fighting ISIS, a very, very costly war. Of course, we're getting assistance, equipment from the international community, but the burden of the war is on our government. The cost of the war is on our government. At the same time, billions of dollars from our coffers are being spent on the displaced people who are in Kurdistan, and oil prices have been low. This financial crisis has actually forced us to engage in economic reforms that we talked about a great deal in the past, but there was never the political will to engage in them. But this time, everybody recognized that we need to implement these reforms. And we've started in, I mean, these are processes that have begun already. We have engaged the World Bank. We invited the World Bank. Usually the World Bank imposes itself on others. We invited the World Bank to work with us to draft a path to reform. And now they're helping us implement these reforms. We have engaged some of the big consultancy firms like Deloitte and Ernst & Young to audit all of our oil revenues retrospectively. And once they've done the auditing, these will be made public. So, and, and we're reforming our finance ministry so that it meets international standards for a finance ministry. These are all reforms that have already begun. And so I would disagree completely with this comparison with the Zimbabwe, even though, again, I haven't read the article. Um, Kurdistan has been uh, a de facto independent uh, territory since 91. We have a functioning government. We have a security force that is among the best in the world. We have managed to keep terrorism out of Kurdistan as much as possible. Nobody is immune, but as much as is possible, we have kept terrorism out of Kurdistan. And when you consider to our north is Syria, which is on fire, to our south has been the Shia-Sunni conflict and insurgency, Kurdistan has been an island of stability and security throughout this period. So I would respectfully disagree with that comparison. Thank you for being with us today. What do you think will be the uh, main challenges, diplomatic and otherwise, facing Iraqi Kurdistan as it attempts to assert its independence, and how can they be overcome? Well, there are many challenges ahead of us. Um, one, of course, is we need to engage in dialogue with Baghdad. As I said earlier, uh, we were very transparent about wanting to have a referendum. It wasn't hidden from either Baghdad or even the international community. And a year ago, in September 2016, President Barzani visited Baghdad and spoke to Prime Minister Abadi, and he spoke about self-determination. So it wasn't a hidden agenda. We were very public about it. And we have also been very clear that we see the referendum as a mandate for our leadership to negotiate with Baghdad on an amicable separation where both sides need to make concessions. So the first challenge is this. Um, the other challenges are, of course, our neighbors. We have Turkey and Iran that are already uh, threatening to take different actions, and we need to engage with them and again, I would say that we have proved to our neighbors since 1991 that Iraqi Kurdistan is a factor for stability. We have done nothing to interfere in Turkey or Iran's domestic affairs. And keep in mind there are millions of Kurds that live in Turkey and Iran. We have kept out of their affairs and we ask them to respect our dialogue with Baghdad. Then the other challenge, of course, is the international community. Um, as I said earlier, the United States and other European countries, the EU, UN, 
wanted us to defer the referendum, but they didn't offer us a strong enough alternative. We were prepared to defer the referendum if we could have a guarantee from the international community that if we hold a referendum in a few years' time after trying to negotiate with Baghdad, and if those negotiations failed, that if we held a referendum in a at a future date, that referendum would be supported and the outcome of the referendum would be respected. No one was ready to give us that guarantee. So we had to go ahead and the referendum has happened. And we know that our friends are disappointed. That's been the word that's been used by the State Department, for example. But we also note that the US, UK and others have said that this does not undermine the historic relationship with Kurdistan. And I think that speaks volumes. Our Peshmerga have worked shoulder to shoulder with the US military, with the British military, with the Canadian military to fight ISIS. And so I don't think this will change overnight, but that is a challenge that we, we need to overcome as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you stated that um, you wanted to engage in dialogue with Baghdad. Is that a dialogue towards a final divorce, the conditions of a final divorce? Or does this dialogue entail, under any circumstance, a return back to Iraq? Is there a formula under which you'll accept to be part of Iraq ever again? Because I was under the opinion that this referendum was held for an independent Kurdistan. Now I'm concerned and uh, confused as a Kurd. Don't be confused. It's for independence. Stop confusing me. <laughs> that was a joke, sorry. I do apologize. It's OK. Um, no, when we talk about a dialogue, what we mean is that you know, we have a choice, right? Like other independence movements across the world. You have a choice. Do you have a referendum and a dialogue and an amicable separation like Czechoslovakia? Or do you unilaterally declare independence? We decided not to unilaterally declare independence, but to have a referendum. One of the reasons why we wanted to have a referendum is when we talked about we want independence, we want self-determination, we were told, oh, this is the vision of just one leader. This doesn't represent all of the parties. This doesn't represent all of the Kurds. Okay. Let's ask the people of Kurdistan. Well, 72% came out to vote, and 92.7% said yes to independence. So this is why we had a referendum. But we're very clear. The question on the referendum paper was, do you want an independent Kurdistan? And is, it is with that mandate that the leadership now negotiates with Baghdad. The, of course, the ideal scenario quoted around the world is the Czechoslovak model, the velvet divorce, it's called. And that is what we want. We want to be good neighbors. We want to have an economic pact, a military pact with Iraq. We can support each other in so many issues. Uh, one of the issues that right now facing both of us is accountability for ISIS, uh, for the crimes that they committed. They committed crimes against people across Iraq. Shia, Sunni, Muslim, Christian, Yazidi, Shabak, Kakei, Kurds. They committed a, incredible crimes, genocide, sexual slavery, enslavement, radicalization of children so that now they don't know wh who they are and what they are and they're getting ready to behead people. They need to be tried for those crimes. We in Baghdad need to work together to enable that to happen. So this is why we want to have an amicable settlement, but ultimately the aim is absolutely independence. Um, thank you very much for coming to speak with us. I had a question. How will independence shape Kurdistan's relationship with the Rojava movement in Syria? 
Uh, well, the Kurds in Syria are, and Turkey, Iran, all of us, we're all linked by blood, by history, by custom, by language. I myself have relatives in Syria and in Turkey. I'm from Iraqi Kurdistan. My husband is an Iranian Kurd, so I cover all the bases. And of course, it's very natural that what happens in one part of Kurdistan will affect our morale, will affect our thinking. I mean, look at the hurricanes in Florida and Houston and Puerto Rico. Everybody is mobilized by that across the United States. And so, of course, it's inevitable that we're linked by thousands of years of history. These borders are 100 years old. Kurdish history goes back thousands of years. Um, my family, we believe that hundreds of years ago, my family was actually originally in Diyarbakir, which is in Turkey, but they ended up in Sinjar in Iraq, now Iraq. So, of course, we're linked by all of these things that I spoke about, but those borders are also political realities, and we need to be pragmatic. So what we have said, by we I mean the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq, what we have said is that we represent only Iraqi Kurds. And in my role and the position of our mission in Washington, D.C., we represent only Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, those other parts of Kurdistan, they need to have their own political representation. They need to have their own dialogue with the national capitals. And if you th remember in Turkey, uh, actually under then Prime Minister Erdogan, there was a great opening in Turkey. So the Kurdish language was decriminalized. There are TV stations that broadcast in Kurdish, uh, Kurdish parties began to win more and more votes in the parliament. And we, by we I mean the KRG, played an instrumental role in the opening that came about between Ankara and the Kurds in Turkey. Unfortunately, a lot of that has unraveled and reversed, but we played an instrumental role in that. And so we see ourselves as a positive factor in those relationships, but we do, don't interfere. So with regards to Rojava or Kurdistan in Syria, there are brethren and whatever happens to them has an impact on us. But we're very clear that we don't interfere in what happens in Syria and we ask Syria not to intervene in what happens in our part of the world. And I, I find it tragic comic that Assad, who right now is potentially committing genocide against his own people, is using chemical weapons against his own people. His own country is disintegrated, disintegrating, has the audacity to speak against our democratic referendum. I mean, I don't know whether to laugh or cry about that. We have time for just maybe two more quick questions. Yes, sir. And then lady in the back. So um, in the event that you all get a state, do you anticipate that state expanding to Kurdish areas in Iran, in Syria, in Turkey? We don't have that plan, and we've been very clear that the referendum is only for Iraqi Kurdistan. And the voting process, uh, you had to show your Iraqi identification papers to be able to register to vote. So. The referendum, the question, is only for Iraqi Kurds. I don't know how things will, will evolve in those countries. Um, you know, Iran is a the theocratic state. Turkey is a semi-democratic state. Syria is on fire. I don't know how things will evolve in those places, but we're only talking about Iraqi Kurdistan. Okay. Um, as a young Kurd, I uh, spent most of my life in America. Um, so a question that I have for my peers, my parents, and I feel like this question, it's unknown, uh, or they cannot answer it. Um, I want to know, as a Kurd in Nashville, in America, and all around the world, what can we do to make this a reality? Well, the role of the Kurdish diaspora 
has been enormous in Kurdistan's recent history, and I would include the referendum in that. But I am also a product of the diaspora. I grew up in London, so from the age of 11, I have lived in the UK or Europe and Japan for a while, now the United States. So I count myself as part of the Kurdish diaspora. And the diaspora has played an instrumental role in speaking out for the people back home when they, they couldn't be heard. And I'm talking about the 80s. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't have the international press when the genocide was taking place in Halabja and Anfal when two, over 200 times Saddam used chemical weapons against the Kurds. Halabja is the most famous incident but I think it's actually close to 200, 250 times Saddam used chemical weapons. It was the diaspora that was protesting and writing to members of Congress and members of Parliament in the democratic countries where they lived. So the role of the diaspora has always been recognized by the Kurdish leadership. With the referendum, Nashville was the first city overseas to have a rally in support of the referendum, and I think you should all be very proud of that. Yes, and, and you, set, you set the example for Kurds in Europe and other parts of North America to do the same. And President Barzani, in his speech, now I'm losing track of time, I believe it was yesterday he made a televised speech, where he thanked the diaspora for their role in supporting the referendum and in trying to rally international support. What you can do now Talk to your members of Congress, talk to your senators, talk to the governors, to talk to anybody who has any political influence, talk to the media, and don't think that it always has to be CNN and you know, the big guns and in the media. Talk to your local press. I started out as a journalist working for a very small uh, newspaper that covered south of London, and then I moved to a north London newspaper and I know the impact of local journalism not just national and international journalism so speak out use all of the democratic and transparent processes that are available to you in a great country like the United States and right now we're seeing more and more members of Congress speak out in favor of independence in favor of self-determination and supporting the democratic process that took part took place in Kurdistan so go ahead and feel empowered you know the people of Kurdistan look to you look to us to speak on their behalf because not only do you know the language by that I mean English you know the language you know the culture you're part of the culture and that's a really powerful tool let me just thank you so much for your kindness and for your candor and for your professionalism. There are many things about today and this, these events that are inspiring and yet, and yet you use the word humbling. Uh, among, among them, of course, the mingling of the community and the students in this very special place. This is a place where we value knowledge and we value dialogue and we value perspectives. And from that, for that reason, on behalf of the Dean, I just want to thank all of you for coming today, those from the community and those students that are here. I think going forward, it's really important that we focus on the things that bind us all together and, in fact, bind Kurdistan to Baghdad as well. Things like human dignity, things like accountability, a collaborative effort to preserve regional stability, to preserve and advance the causes of human rights and economic stability. Those are things that bind us all together. And I think it's very important that we focus on the things that we share and the values that we share as a civilized group of societies rather than just allowing the dialogue, and this is partly an answer to your question, to be about the things that divide. No, we share far more than, than, than divides. And, and in fact, these problems that we face collectively are so large that no single entity, no single party, no single group of people anywhere in the world can solve them in isolation. We must work together to achieve these fundamental things of human rights and economic stability and human dignity and self-determination and freedom. Thank you so much for coming. I understand there are a few people that would like pictures. That's possible, provided that we stick to the schedule, because unfortunately, there's a plane on the way back to Washington that must be met. So with that, thank you so much for your attendance.